Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Discovering the Architecture Middle Path podcast. Uh, we spoke about uh, a few topics uh, earlier about some fundamental concepts of architecture. We spoke about the size of a service and uh, we spoke about uh, APIs versus services. And uh, we thought of pick another interesting topic today. Uh, it's about platform engineering. I think uh, the word platform is um, heavily overused these days and it has become a marketing buzzword as well uh, people put few things together and naming it a platform as well uh, on the same side uh, if you look at uh, priorities uh, inside the enterprises everybody trying to build or building a platform and uh, platform engineering has become a very hot topic uh, so we thought of look at it from the architect point of view as well because there's a uh, platform architecture component about why we should build a platform as well as what are the uh, key things that uh, we should consider when building a platform. Uh, so Sanjay, there are many definitions uh, about the platform and uh, one thing that uh, struck me was uh, uh, there's a definition about uh, a platform is a supporting structure that increases the uh, effectiveness of a community. And even we can apply it to real world as well. Like if we go to a airport, if we go to a train station, or even a, a, a shopping mall, uh, can treat as a platform because it's providing that uh, uh, particular foundation for uh, to uh, to connect the community and then uh, uh, become more efficient. I think same uh, uh, concept coming for the enterprises as well. Uh, with the complexity as well as the business needs, everybody is keen on uh, uh, building these platforms. Um, so with that, uh, I, I would like to get uh, your thoughts on this because um, uh, we have been involved in uh, architecting and building many platforms uh, and helping uh, many organizations on the same task as well uh, to share our experience. Yeah, thank you, Asanka. Um, and nice to continue our conversation. Uh, certainly, platform is one of these overused words. And in fact, uh, uh, general guidance, if you're making a product, we don't call it a platform because uh, it's just everything is a platform. On the other hand, a platform is also a very fundamental concept because it is a platform. It is something you stand on. And as something you stand on, it never finishes. As in, there's always another shoulder to stand on. You know, one of the things people say about open source is open source is successful because you're standing on the shoulders of giants. And those giants are giving you another platform. You know, when, when you start off, you might start off with the platform of the system call interface. Then you start off with the set of APIs and you start off and so on, right? Keep going up. And in fact, in, in the cloud world, of course, there is platform as a service which is sort of a broad statement saying whatever the thing it is available as a service. And uh, a, the, the need for a platform, of course, um, really is about what are you trying to build? You know, if, you're, if you're building a house, you need a foundation. It's kind of you know, given because if you build a house without a foundation, the house won't be stable, right? And depending on the soil conditions, depending on how big a house or tower, tall tower you're building, the foundation design and the foundation uh, strength and complexity varies. So just like that, when you're building a piece of software, you need a foundation. And the complexity of that depends on what kind of thing you're trying to orchestrate and manage and what's going to run on top of that eventually. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, you made a really uh, um, uh, important point about um, uh, kind of uh, centralizing the expertise but decentralizing the innovation right now even if we take a theater as a platform that's exactly what's happening the infrastructure and the fundamental stuff required to run a, a show provided by the platform but uh, creative people come and uh, utilize the platform and um, uh, do various acts on that and uh, give a great experience for the uh, viewers I think same uh, concept is uh, applying here as well. Uh, so the the uh, uh, I think another thing that you mentioned about the uh, uh, how uh, the design thinking should come right because we need to consider 
uh, not a smaller group. Now, it's going to be a wider set of people who's going to access the platform. Uh, so if we don't have the consumption of the platform, then there's no point of uh, having a platform as well, right? So that's why I think the architecture thinking uh, will be really important when designing the platform to address uh, some of these uh, core capabilities that we should provide uh, out of the platform. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the, the having clarity on who's going to be consuming uh, is going to help you answer the critical question, what is the problem you're trying to solve by building this? Right? And who are you yeah. solving it for? So if you're solving it, if you're building a platform for developers, there's a certain set of expectations and there's a certain set of things that you're trying to essentially raise the abstraction, coming back to our sort of underlying theme of how to do computer science right uh, is using abstractions. Platforms are another kind of abstraction. Every time you build another platform, you're building an abstraction layer. And like all other abstractions, if the abstraction is leaky, it's not very good. If the abstraction is... Uh, sort of uh, not abstract, not, not clean, not orthogonal. Uh, yeah, you can do stuff, but you're hacking your way around it. So I think getting that right, getting the architecture of a platform right, whether it is under the guise of platform engineering, which is our latest uh, uh, sort of fad in the marketplace, uh, or platform as a service, now, that is very important to understand what am I, who am I solving this problem for? What is the problem I'm trying to solve? And who am I solving it for? Right? If you go to platform yeah. as a service, you have, you know, if you go to uh, AWS or Azure or GCP or any of the other uh, cloud providers, they have now thousands in the case of the larger ones of services available there. So it's a platform that gives all of those services available to the use, but then you on your own on top of that right so and then you could build a layer on top of that and so forth yeah yeah i think that that's a interesting thing because people think just signing up with a, a cloud provider uh, gives them a, a platform but it's a, a misconception there's a, platform a, menu, a really. massive architecture involvement yeah. exactly so that's why uh, it's uh, you need to do that plumbing and then connections yeah. and uh, look at it from the more enterprise architecture point of view. What are the governance? What are the policies that you should apply? And there are compliance requirements when it comes to different type of business domains. All these things need to be considered, not just uh, signing up with a cloud provider. Yeah, and and, and uh, you know, in the case in, in uh, this continuing on that sort of governance and policies and so on. Um, now we. You know, we've talked here and there about APIs and API first and so forth. And, and we'll be talking more about that because that's a fundamental concept. But uh, APIs, so if you're doing, uh, today's general um, guideline is if, you're, if you write some piece of code, if that piece of code cannot be accessed as a network service by some other piece of code, you're writing something that is a dead end. If only a human being can use it and no software can use it, it's a dead end, right? Uh, because you can't have further composition. You can't stand on the shoulder of that giant and build another layer. So that means API-based uh, design is critical because that's what APIs are for. It's a way of, an API is not some modern web fancy thing. It goes back to system calls. And you, you know, that's how the term API came. Application programming interface was a system call interface. System call was for the, the kernel provided services and APIs were for other libraries you picked up now of course we access them over the network so things like that when you so what what the, the so the from a developer perspective what i want is to be able to write the code that i want and get this platform to do some work for me that's the whole point right it's to offload uh, the balance between what i do versus what somebody else can do what the platform kind of does out of the box for me right and and that's the key yeah. to figuring out what are all the things that we can offload of the developer. The more you offload, the more you make developers' life easier, faster, better, cheaper, safer, more productive, all of that. Yeah, I think uh, so. That's where the best practices that inbuilt into the platform um, uh, will play a role. 
as well as uh, the self-service nature is very important as well because I have seen some of these platforms. Still, you have to talk to the platform engineering team to get something done. But that is not what exactly the developer wants, right? Uh, so uh, uh, look at it from the day one and then you architect it in a way and then keep on improving is very important when it comes to platform engineering and uh, uh, platform architecture. Yeah, I, I think uh, that's a very critical point that, that enabling, empowering developers is really what the fundamental problem you're trying to solve is. Get out of the way. Uh, you know, many years ago, I remember we had a customer and in the early days of WCDCW 2006 or so, it's a large Wall Street bank. And their timeline from the time of ordering a computer to getting an IP address so they can log into it was nine months. Right? It wasn't, it wasn't because they didn't have money. Uh, you know, obviously they had literally infinite amounts of money to buy stuff. But you had to order it, you had to go through procurement, you had to get it shipped, you had to show up at some, you know, it's a, a loading dock. It had to find its way into the server room. Somebody's got to install it, plug it in, install the operating, you know, blah, 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 right? And of course, Amazon fundamentally changed that to saying, hey, developer, you want a VM, go to a website, fill a form, and you got an IP address. End of conversation, right? And it took seconds, not, not nine months. Uh, in fact, that company, I remember uh, there was a brilliant architect who was leading it. He was trying to build, uh, his vision was a URL for everything, whether it's a VM or a process or whatever, right? So it's kind of what we are still building to some extent. Uh, a, a, so so that, that empowerment that you can give to developers saying, I don't need to wait for somebody else to create a database for me. I don't need to wait for somebody else to uh, run the test for me. I don't need to wait for somebody else. It's really about saying, hey, just get on with whatever you need to do. Yeah. I think if you look at it and uh, uh, think on that lines, then naturally the productivity will increase. Uh, of the developer so that will feed into this some of the engineering metrics like uh, the uh, uh, flow efficiency mean time to repair mean time to detect all these things will get increased and then it's affecting the delivery of the business side right then we can quickly deliver these uh, 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 the, the products or the services that we are building and uh, then it is getting into the digital experiences that the business is looking for. Uh, so we can, uh, uh, like, uh, as you mentioned, quickly and uh, uh, fastly, like we can deliver this stuff in a very uh, cost effective manner as well. So that is the impact or the uh, value that uh, a platform engineering team can bring into the organization. Yeah, absolutely. In the end, you know, Technical guys get, get happy and get enjoy when you see a nice big Kubernetes cluster running and, and you can run a pipeline and everything flows through. But if you're on the business side of the equation, like, what is that? That doesn't solve any problem for me or for my customers, right? I need something that delivers an, either an experience for a human being or, or a digital capability that I sell as an API or whatever. But I need something that is working that delivers value on the other side, I can't, I'm not interested in uh, sort of being a technician, right? Uh, well, it's great. You need to do some technical stuff to make it all work. But the only thing that matters in the end is what is the outcome that you're delivering from the systems that you built. Right? And, and, and sometimes we forget, you know, the older, if you go back, uh, you know, decades, when, if you go back to mainframes, if you go back to... Uh, uh, the, you know, earlier distributed system architectures, a lot of these things were very constrained, but yet very productive. Uh, in fact, I remember Paul and I wrote a paper. Uh, Paul is our co-founder and was our CTO for, uh, for a long time. Uh, uh, we wrote a paper, I think this was while we were still in IBM, both of us were in IBM at the time, about uh, service-oriented architecture and explaining how uh, IBM CICS Kix was actually an SOA architecture, right? And and it's how how it maps, and we even came up with a way to represent those uh, COBOL copy books in uh, in XML schema, if I remember right, and, and a bunch of stuff. Now so it was a CSAM article. Right? The point being, abstractions of services has been around, and those older systems were far more restricted, but yet far more productive on one side. The reliability was incredible. I mean, if you think about the compute power they offered compared to what we have now. 
it's a fraction yet you know planes flew people got tickets did all that stuff right banking system worked through all the systems and it comes from a platform that was a very very strong platform that had opinions about a bunch of stuff you know and it gave a framework saying developers stay within this framework you do this you do this and we will do this and that and the other thing yeah i think this soa uh, concept that you brought uh, uh, reminds me something about the cultural aspect as well as a platform engineer and architect that we need to a uh, little bit think about this stuff like uh, the two pizza teams and then autonomy and um, uh, remote work uh, as well with the pandemic uh, people went remote uh, so one thing you mentioned in a different conversation about the modularity i think uh, we are kind of experts in modularity coming from our carbon framework to various other products that we built um, so uh, if you can talk a little bit about the modularity and then how it is important as well as how it is affecting the platform uh, that will be helpful for the audience yeah yeah uh, so uh, modularity you know if, if you in, in the real world if you're running uh, if you, you know let's talk if nobody's running the world so to speak so let's start running a country if you're running a country you're running a large business you're running an organization of any kind uh, you basically divide responsibility and give autonomy and let people run stuff right you modularize it's the only way you can solve complex problems you split the problem up into pieces that different entities run different things so the the computer science abstraction concept uh, and, and modularity are kind of fundamental to everything because it allows you to decompose complex problems and then put a facade over it and kind of see the problem only from that facade and mod modularity is also hierarchical you can say modularity goes all the way down to if you're using an object oriented programming language a class construct in an object oriented language is all about modularity of course and one level up you have at a programming language level we have often this concept called modules which was invented in the 1970s or 1980s in modular 2 uh, and so forth so th there are these kind of concepts about uh, at a language level and then you can keep taking it up a service then is an abstraction which is a modular entity because now it's a network accessible class in some sense right where which has some some services might be stateful some might be stateless but uh, it's still modular uh, in, in some architecture and of course service orientation is an abstract concept and we've had this religious debate about SOFL microservices wins uh, and now microservices is no good we are going to monoliths you know you see lots of articles coming out saying the, 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 the primary reason is they don't follow the middle path following our theming of our uh, uh, this podcast right because people yeah. think when you read an article saying Netflix is doing that service uh, microservices well great everybody's got to do microservices you know and break every every one plus two becomes a microservice. Uh, uh, it doesn't work. Uh, you know, even in programming languages, uh, in small talk, one plus two is the plus message being sent to the one object with the two object as an argument. Uh, it works. Syntactically, it's still one plus two, so you don't go nuts saying, you know, one dot plus parenthesis two or whatever syntax you want to come up with. But it's too much because, you know, one plus two is just one plus two. Do the damn math, right? Um, like that, there are you need to find a, a compromise level of what you granularize into, and it's a recursive problem. So, so the the way you solve problems should be you figure out how to partition independent dimensions, and then you modularize and recursively go down, down, down. Eventually, you might end up with a class or classes or functions or whatever, right? And uh, and now the cell architecture concept of Sankar that you and Paul came up with uh, some years ago is actually another level of modularity, which is trying to map to the business domains and give a runtime architecture for how to maintain modularity at another level, right? Exactly. Yeah, I think it's uh, kind of connecting the business and the uh, technology nicely, as well as modularity uh, provides this... Uh, a versioning and uh, a backward compatibility related issues we have to handle as well as reusability increase the reusability composability all these are bringing when you have a proper modular architecture 
Uh, so I think it's a key component uh, inside uh, the platform designing. Yeah, I think uh, we spoke uh, a lot about the platform engineering part and uh, we will continue this discussion. Uh, probably we will look at some of the challenges that uh, we identified while building as well as helping um, uh, to build such platforms in a, a different uh, uh, episode. Uh, so uh, thanks for joining. Uh, anything uh, you want to add Sanjeev at the end? No, oh, thank you very much for joining. I think, yeah, I think this topic of building platforms uh, is always going to be a never ending topic. You know, iPhone is a platform, right? And we build apps on it. Now, ChatGPT is a platform. Uh, you know, platforms are evolving as well as technology evolves. So, it's always a fun topic to discuss. At the same time, there are some principles behind successful platforms that are worth uh, understanding so that you can try to create. A platform because uh, uh, and we will we'll talk more about this at some point. But every business has to build a platform for themselves, which represents the business. Uh, that's you know that that is the that is what allow, gives them digital agility. And get into that requires platform engineering at multiple levels uh, to be done. So thank you for watching. Yep, and thanks. It was a great conversation and catch you guys on another episode. Thanks.